Reynolds, and I'll be telling you about a new project that I started with within the past year with colleagues at the University of Kiel. So, plant primary metabolism is the staff of life. The carbohydrates, lipids, proteins that plants produce are the ultimate source of most biological molecules on Earth. However, plant primary metabolism is kind of boring. It's almost completely invariant across the uh, across all green plants. In contrast, plant, sec plant secondary metabolism is the spice of life. There's a vast diversity of compounds, uh, perhaps as many as 200,000, with many interesting biological functions. And there's this great variation when we look across the uh, phylogeny of green plants in terms of the types of secondary metabolites they produce. So uh, Ehrlich and Raven, in proposing the escape and radiate model of coevolution, one of the things they were trying to explain is the high phenotypic diversity of secondary metabolites when we look across flowering plants. And they explain this phenotypic diversity as a response to selection imposed by the herbivores, specifically the butterflies. And this includes the diversity of metabolites across plant lineages and the diversity of metabolites within plant species. So uh, if we consider the escape and radiate model, it predicts an escalation of defense chemistry over evolutionary history. If we start with a plant lineage that produces a certain metabolite, it protects it from all herbivores except for one group of um, uh, resistant herbivores. And so this plant lineage is under selection from those herbivores so that a new metabolite that uh, those herbivores can't detoxify provides an escape and an opportunity for radiation in the absence of attack. But of course, at a certain point, um, another herbivore evolves resistance to that metabolite and colonizes that plant lineage. And so this uh, process repeats, and we have this chemical escalation in the plant insect. So is chemical de-escalation ever adaptive? Uh, yes, when producing a secondary metabolite actually decreases plant fitness. And we just saw um, a, a, in situations, for example, when competition with other plants have a greater impact on fitness than our herbivory. So this is the growth defense trade-off, and we just heard a uh, great talk about that. Another defense may make secondary metabolites superf superfluous, for example, in plants that evolve ant guard symbioses. Or in this situation may occur that the plant is attacked primarily by adapted herbivores that uh, through a feat of physiological jujitsu use the metabolite to actually increase their own fitness. So that they can use this metabolite to locate their host plants. They could co-opt the metabolite as a chemical defense against their own predators. Or, um, as in the uh, case I'm about to present, the metabolite has actually become a nutrient for the herbivore. So in 1974, Edgar and his co-authors proposed de-escalation of pyrrolosidine alkaloids, this distinctive class of alkaloids with this um, uh, double ring pyrrole in the middle, in opossinaceae, the milkweed, dogbane family under selection from their adapted herbivores, the Denaeae, which are the milkweed and clear green butterflies. And there's just a few examples of Denaeae interacting with Apocinaceae. And they proposed this hypothesis based on the very interesting relationship that Denaeae have to paralosidine alkaloids. So Apocinaceae are the hypothesized ancestral larval host plants of Denaeae. So here's a summary phylogeny of Apocinaceae, and we see the distribution of Denaean host plants on this phylogeny. Uh, Denaean host plants have been documented in most of the more derived lineages of Apocinaceae. Uh, Pyrrolosidine alkaloids, uh, and I'm going to be referring to them as PAs throughout, appear to be rather rare secondary metabolites in Apocinaceae. So uh, PAs are documented as present in only six of 366 genera of Apocinaceae, and they uh, belong to 
just four, they've been documented in just four major lineages of 27. As, and as you can see, Denyamy use host plants that, uh, apostinaceous host plants that have perilosinine alkaloids, and they use apostinaceous host plants that don't have perilosinine alkaloids. So how did this situation evolve? Well, um, Edgar and his colleagues proposed that the first step in, in is the evolution of PAs in apostinaceae as a defensive compound. Um, this defense was breached by the Denian ancestor that first uh, evolved tolerance to the compound, then sequestration, and then went even a step further and actually co-opted the compound to the point where in Denian today, perilosidine alkaloids are a nutrient. The males use the alkaloids to synthesize their mating pheromone, which they disperse uh, during courtship to advertise the load of alkaloids that they that they bear. And during mating, uh, it's been shown in uh, at least one species, Danaeus, um, um, uh, in at least one species of Danaeus, the males actually uh, donate alkaloids to the females along with the sperm package, and so protecting, chemically protecting the female and her eggs. So now what is a plant to do? It has an herbivore that thrives um, on its formerly defensive compound. So apostinaceae then evolved under selection pressure from these adapted herbivores. And we have, so this sort of escalation today, uh, this sort of situation today, where some apostinaceae species have retained perilosidine alkaloids and the denyamy herbivores that feed on those plants get those alkaloids from their hosts. We can think uh, that this uh, PAs may have been maintained because there are other susceptible herbivores that are more of a fitness, sorry, um, that uh, cost the plant more in fitness than the adapted denyamine. And we have other uh, species that under selection from uh, denyamine, there these larvae, um, have lost the alkaloids, and now, even though the Denyamy still feed on these apostinaceous host plants, uh, the adults have to go elsewhere to get their alkaloids. So in many species of Denyamy, we see this behavior of adult pharmacophagy, where adult butterflies will go to all sorts of sources of perilosity alkaloids, feeding on PA-containing nectars, and often you'll see them on uh, dying leaf tissues of PA containing plants getting those alkaloids. So to test this de-escalation de hypothesis, we can reconstruct the evolution of the PA phenotype, and this is the predicted reconstruction, so a single origin of PAs in apostinaceae followed by multiple losses. But with enough homoplasy, this de-escalation scenario may be indistinguishable from an escalation scenario where you have multiple independent origins of PAs. Luckily, we can study PAs not just by looking at the phenotype, but also looking at the evolution of the biosynthetic pathway. So the first step of biosynthesis of perilosidine alkaloids is catalyzed by homospermidine synthase, which I'll be referring to as HSS uh, throughout, and it catalyzes the um, production of homospermidine, which uh, ultimately becomes this characteristic base of the perilosity alkaloid. So homospermidine synthase evolved by a gene duplication from another uh, gene called deoxyhypusin synthase, DHS. And DHS is a ubiquitous gene of eukaryotic metabolism. It catalyzes the, uh, its primary function is to catalyze the activation of EIF5A, which is a transcription factor, but as a side reaction, it can actually catalyze the synthesis of homospermidine. So HSS evolved by gene duplication and subfunctionalization, where it has lost the EIF5A activation function and has become much more processive at synthesizing homospermidine. And we know that this uh, uh, biosynthetic pathway, HSS, has evolved multiple times across uh, 
uh, in the diversification of flowering plants, always, and as we can see, we have at least five instances here of origin of HSS via duplication um, from DHS. So if we look at the evolution of the uh, of HSS, we can more clearly di discriminate between the de-escalation and the escalation scenario. So the de-escalation scenario predicts a single duplication giving rise to HSS followed by uh, multiple pseudogenization events. So here we see one gain of HSS, two losses, so our de-escalation scenario. Whereas our escalation scenario would predict multiple independent origins of HSS with an approximacy. So three independent origins, escalation. So to answer this question posed a long time ago now, was there um, evolutionary de-escalation of paralosinine alkaloids in approximacy? We reconstructed the HSS DHS gene tree and then uh, tried to identify potential pseudogenes. So we began with blast searches of genomic uh, several genomic databases, including three transcriptome databases and the Asclepias syriaca genome, uh, nuclear genome, and we used those to design degenerate primers for DHS and HSS, and we amplified a region between exons two and six of the gene. And so here is our gene tree. These are um, all of the sequences we've been gathered. Uh, we gathered both from the um, databases and the new ones we've generated. These are exons only, uh, so we excluded the introns here. And so first thing we can see, there's 100% bootstrap support for monophylic of all sequences from apostinaceae. So um, our conclusion is HSS and apostinaceae evolve independently from HSS in related families. Furthermore, we have 100% bootstrap support for all sequences from a clade called the apsoclade, which is a very well-characterized lineage of apostinaceae that includes most of the uh, known denied host plants. And within that apsoclade, we have a well-supported clade that includes all HSS sequences, so a single origin of HSS. And we know that this clade includes HSS because we have functional, functionally characterized one of those genes, so in one species, that is the HSS from Parsonsia alpha fluorescence, and there is the DHS from Parsonsia alpha fluorescence. So we have a single origin of HSS. Uh, we know that all six of the genera that are documented as producing paralosine alkaloids have both an HSS and DHS orthologue. In addition, we found HSS orthologs in at least 60 genera that have never been reported as producing PAs. Still, for most of them, we still don't know if they have a, um, sorry, if they have, if that HSS is functional, but we have identified at least one obvious pseudogene of HSS. So this is in Asclepias syriaca, and that uh, HSS, uh, that gene has a single base pair deletion in exon 2 that would predict a truncated protein. So it's very likely, so that along with that extremely long branch suggests that we have at least one pseudogene. So, so far, um, this all looks very good for the de-escalation hypothesis. And at this point, I will uh, invite 